Doc, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love modern technology. You know, the Internet's a wonderful thing in many ways, and it, and it gets us out to places that we couldn't get to before. But, that's you know, no with that, you get Maybe the curveballs also. <laughs> Maybe the blog talk staff isn't working after 5 p.m. <laughs> it's not Hawaiian shirt Friday till tomorrow. <laughs> but anyway, Doc, we're, we're, we've got a lot of listeners out there that are uh, concerned about future events. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the web bot or Cliff High, uh, people like that, but they do a lot of talk, a lot of, of, of um, interviews pertaining to um, the 2012 prophecies and um, how that affects us from a celestial standpoint. And um, I've seen a lot of interviews and heard a lot of interviews with you talking about this kind of stuff, and we just kind of wanted to get into that. Um, so I guess to start, it all, start off the conversation, um, 2012 prophecies as it relates to the Mayans, what, how did they foresee this coming about? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, there was a king whose name was Pakal, and uh, he made a tomb that had a very interesting record on it. It was discovered in 1958, and a couple of years after that, uh, Jose Arguez went down there, and because he was born in America, went down there and, and actually saw the lid. And at the time, he was studying art, and since that time became a, a very accomplished artist. And he saw that Pakal had put a message in the design of his tomb lid. And it was really Jose Arguez that discovered the 2012 connection and, and saw that what he was depicting on the, on the tomb lid of his, of his uh, internment was a story of how Earth was going to line up with the rift in the Milky Way, December 21st, 2012, according to their long count Mayan calendar, and that this was going to be cataclysmic to the Earth, or it was going to be the dawn of a great, almost like bathing of the Earth in a very special energy, like a reset or like, a, like an awakening, but it was still going to be you know, physically cataclysmic, as long as people were not prepared for it. So he began to try to tell the world about this 2012 connection and for 30 years was just seen as a nutcase. And really, in the late 90s, people had sort of started to talk about it. Uh, my co-author and I, in 2001, started writing The Ark of Millions of Years, which took us three years to write. We had each done over 20 years of research on it. Mm -hmm. And when we published the book in 2004, there were, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen titles out there on, on 2012. Now there's probably 250 titles on 2012. But uh, that, that 1,500 pages really opened my eyes as we went into the Zohar. We went into the Sefer Yetzirah. We went into actually 40 ancient works, some of which had just been translated into English. So they weren't even available, you know, 15 years ago. And what we found was this amazing discovery, a rediscovery, or, or sort of message that had been left from past generations about this amazing alignment that was going to take place of the Earth with this um, planar gravity uh, force and, and strange energies that come from the center of our galaxy and that there would be all kinds of signs leading up to it. And lo and behold, the signs are happening. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? And what, what amazes me even further is the parallels that you see uh, from the Mayan prophecies to the Bible. The Bible speaks of a lot of these precursors um, in the same fashion. And, um, yeah, it does. Uh, the English Bible... Uh, especially the King James Bible, a lot of things have been expunged from the original record. Exactly right. Uh, e exactly right. I, I kind of, so when I 
when I go back and I do my research, my biblical research, um, although it's an English translation, I go back to the Greek and Hebrew versions of the uh, Bible prior to the King James being put out. You can see a lot. You can see a lot of things that were removed, that were rewritten, that were stylized. And, it, and, you know, if you take that as the gospel, then you lose the original meaning of the guy who originally transcribed it. And the guy that transcribed it was probably third or fourth generation away from the original story. Right. Now, the, uh, you talked about the galactic plane or the equator. Um, what's the cause and effect relationship between the galactic plane, or as the Mayans called it, the dark rift, and the Earth? What's, what's, the, what's the relationship that we have between the galactic plane and the Earth, or our solar system? Uh, well, it, very recently, astrophysicists have, have come to a consensus, and I, and I mean that's just one more physicist than 50%. <laughs> Uh, that in the center of every galaxy is a, what we call a supermassive spinning black hole. This is, a, this is an area where gravity is so intense light cannot escape, but it has consumed millions of suns. So it has so much mass in it, and it's spinning at its absolute maximum speed for its particular mass that the black hole tends to flatten out, kind of like a flying saucer. And mm -hmm. what happens is the bodies that we can see with our eyes tend to distribute themselves along that galactic line. That's why galaxies look like pinwheels out in space and the center of them ha has a big bulge. It is pretty well believed that these black holes are actually the gravity engines that light up the whole galaxy. Now, the, it used to be thought back in Maxwell's day that black holes form perfectly round, what he called hairless balls in the middle of space. <laughs> perfectly round with no mountains, no stalactites sticking out on it because of its, of its uh, mathematical function. But what happens when these things get very large, like hundreds of thousands or even tens of millions of suns, they tend to distort. And this galaxy plane goes all the way out to the very edge and even beyond into the galaxy, rippling space-time along the way. Now, Earth is on one of the outer arms of the Milky Way galaxy. Our sun is what's known as a main sequence sun, but it's rather small compared to most stars in the galaxy. And so our solar system, from time to time, and, and that, that's about every 26,000 years, passes through this galactic plane. And there is evidence that this has happened before on that time scale. There's a, a, uh, an event we call the black axiom. And the black axiom is where sort of, it's like dark matter, but it's real solid matter, like iron dust or carbide dust. Mm -hmm. And it can be quite dense. When bodies pass through it, they get thoroughly coated with it. Now, if the bodies are rotating pretty quickly, like Earth, they get fairly uniformly coated. But if they rotate very slowly, like our moon, they get half coated. And there are lots of asteroids in our belt that we notice that are half black and half white. Our moon is half black and half white. The dark side of the moon actually faces the Earth. The light side of the moon faces away from the Earth. Wow. <laughs> That's... Uh... That's pretty heavy, and I didn't, know about, I didn't know about that. I mean, I know about the dark side of the moon, but I never understood it from a, that kind of standpoint. The um, yeah, dark side faces us, and it happened about 25,000 years ago because the side that faces us is pretty uniformly dark. There's no large meteor strikes in it that are white, like uh, if you were uh, uh, you know, throwing a, a ball out in a, on, a, on a black beach, you know, the white sand would... would splatter up onto the black surface. We have about 25,000 years worth of meteor strikes on mm -hmm. our side of the moon. Wow. The um, sun. Now, the sun is also directly affected by the gravitational pull of um, the center of the galaxy. And right now, we're experiencing an unusual, uh, unusual solar minimum 
uh, more of an extension of the solar minimum. Right now, we should be 